Number three, deliver us from evil. Ralph Sarchi has an interesting profession. He's a retired New York police sergeant who worked some of the toughest streets for 16 years. He said he's seen the most horrible things humans do to each other. And yet, he'd rather take on 10 armed robbers with just his hands than take on demons. Sarchi's other gig is performing exorcisms as a demonologist. Sarchi said the strange things he's seen during his time as a cop led him towards demonology. Sarchi is a devout Christian and he said his work isn't about the devil, it's about God. One of Sarchi's most chilling investigations started on November 2nd, 1991. Sarchi went to the house of Dominic Villanova of Westchester County, north of New York City. Sarchi brought along his exorcism partner, Joe Forrester. Forrester worked as a polygraph examiner. They weren't expecting to perform any religious rituals that night. They were just asked to conduct interviews for an exorcist to evaluate. When they arrived at the house, Dominic answered the door with his five-year-old son. They both looked terrified. When Sarchi and Forrester walked into their home, they saw piles of clothes and rolled up bedding in the living room. The two parents and four kids were sleeping there because they were too scared to go anywhere in their home alone. Sarchi and Forrester interviewed the family. Dominic said that the demon first appeared in their bedroom. His wife, Gabby, saw a woman appear in a cloud of smoke. The spirit said, I just want your help. The spirit appeared to Gabby the next day in a mirror. The spirit said, Parents, help. The third time Gabby saw the spirit, she was in the basement and it partially possessed her. Dominic would see Gabby become stiff and stutter. The spirit would try to talk through her. The spirit said her name was Virginia Taylor and she was murdered on her wedding day. Gabby was especially concerned about Virginia's story because Gabby was planning her daughter's wedding. Gabby had tried to figure out who killed Virginia Taylor by digging into the archives of the library, but she couldn't find anything. Gabby was eager to find out more, so she let Virginia possess her. Gabby then pulled out a pen and paper and asked Virginia to show her where she lived. Through Gabby, Virginia scribbled on the paper, then she wrote an M or a W. Gabby shared the information with Dominic, and he became concerned with his wife's well-being. Gabby thought that the spirit was a woman looking for help. Dominic thought the spirit was evil. Dominic contacted the priest, and he visited their home. Once the priest left, the spirit said to Gabby, I've dealt with the priest before, and this time, I'll win the battle. The spirit then said, Holy ones must not come. At this point in the interview, Sarchi decided to tour the house while Forrester continued to talk to the family. The investigators were convinced the demon was giving Gabby a fake sob story so it could take over her body. In the room that was said to be Virginia's room, Sarchi saw a ball of light. Sarchi went into the basement and felt uneasy in the storage room. As a cop, he was good at remaining calm, but his heart was racing and he couldn't take his eyes off the double doors in the storage room. Then he felt a piercing pain in his head and he felt like he was going to vomit. He threw holy water at the door and ran back to the living room. Forrester handed Sarchi a note that the spirit had ran through Gabby just the night before. It read, Harm will come to those below. Beware the night. When Sarchi was being attacked in the basement, Forrester found out that Gabby's oldest daughter, Luciana, had been experiencing assaults for weeks. Gabby had been planning Luciana's wedding. Weeks earlier, Luciana was reading in her room with a glass of water by her bed. Suddenly, the glass launched at her. Luckily, it missed her head. 
After that, she didn't want to sleep alone, so she slept in her sister's room. In her sister's room, her bed started shaking. Luciana started being scratched every day. Usually, the scratches would disappear in minutes. But one night, she woke up with the number 666 etched into her arm. Gabby asked the spirit if there were any other spirits in the house. The spirit said there were two, one who was good and one who was evil. Shortly afterward, Gabby saw the ghost of her deceased father, and he told Gabby that Virginia was a nice lady. The investigators thought that her father's spirit was really a demon who would shapeshift into the spirit of Virginia and Gabby's father to gain her trust. After this sighting, the attacks on Luciana got worse. She was punched, kicked, dragged around the floor, bitten, and yanked by her hair. That's when the Villanovas all decided to sleep in the living room together. But none of them could sleep because their furniture would fly around the room. Books would fly off the bookshelf with so much force that they would dent the walls. The TV and radio would turn on by themselves. They would hear moaning and growls coming from the basement. Creepy messages would appear in the bathroom mirror like the word help. Forrester asked if anyone in the family had played with a Ouija board. Luciana's two sisters said that they had. Then, right after they asked that question, Luciana was attacked right there in front of her family and the investigators. She screamed, and a red scratch appeared on her cheek. Then something invisible pulled her hair and visibly jerked her head. Suddenly, she started shaking, and she said, Holy Ones, be gone. Sergeant Forrester prayed and temporarily released the demon. They called a priest to stay the night with the family. When the priest arrived, Sergeant Forrester left because they felt like the family was in good hands. The priest was trying to get permission from the bishop to perform an exorcism, but the request was denied. Months went by and the Villanovas called Sarchi and Forrester again. The attacks were still happening. Sarchi and Forrester returned to their home with holy water, salt, incense, and a cross. They performed an exorcism themselves. They prayed and burned so much incense that it looked like the house was on fire. Eventually, the house went calm and the demon was gone. That's just one of hundreds of exorcisms Sarchi has performed. In 2001, Sarchi published a book called Beware of the Night. It details some of the exorcisms he's performed. In 2014, the movie Deliver Us From Evil, starring Eric Bana as Sarchi, was released. It's based on Ralph Sarchi's double life as a police sergeant and a demon fighter, and it has some details from Beware of the Night. Sarchi worked as an advisor on the film. Number 2. The Exorcist In 1971, William Peter Blatty released his classic horror novel, The Exorcist. More than 13 million copies were sold in the United States. Blatty adapted the novel into a screenplay. The infamous movie of the same name was released in 1973. It is one of the most profitable horror movies of all time. It was the first horror movie nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. The story centers around 12-year-old Reagan, who becomes possessed. The book and the movie are based on the real experiences of Ronald Edwin Hunkler. In 1949, Ronald was nearly 14 years old and he was living in Cottage City, Maryland. He and his family lived in a brick, colonial-style home with huge trees around the yard. He lived with his parents and grandmother. Ronald was close with his Aunt Tilly. She lived in St. Louis, Missouri, but would often visit Ronald. On one of her visits, she introduced Ronald to a Ouija board. 
Aunt Tilly was a spiritualist who would communicate with spirits through Ouija boards and seances. Ronald started using the Ouija board in his house alone. In January 1949, Ronald's family started hearing strange scratching sounds on the walls and the floors. It sounded like claws were scraping against wood. The sounds would start at 7 p.m. and continue until midnight. Eleven days after the scratching sound started, Aunt Tilly died. Then the family started hearing footsteps. Ronald's mom thought it was Aunt Tilly. Soon, even more mysterious things started happening. One time when Ronald walked into the bedroom, a Bible flew from the bookcase and landed at his feet. A hanger flew from the closet and across the room on its own. The kitchen table tipped over on its own. One day, Ronald and his family were sitting in the living room when the chair Ronald was sitting in started to levitate, then flipped over, throwing Ronald to the floor. At first, Ronald's parents thought he was pulling pranks, but Ronald swore he wasn't doing anything. Weeks went by and furniture kept flying around. Eventually, Ronald's parents brought him to a physician, a psychologist, and a psychiatrist, but nothing was medically wrong with him. The family was Lutheran, and they eventually turned to their pastor for help. Since nothing was medically wrong, they thought that Ronald might be possessed by an evil spirit. The pastor saw Ronald's blankets move across the room while Ronald was sleeping. He saw Ronald be tipped out of a chair on its own. In February, Ronald would wake up with scratches on his body. The pastor thought that Ronald was possessed and recommended the family find a Catholic priest. In late February, Ronald's father called a local Catholic church and spoke with Father Hughes. Ronald's father was given a bottle of holy water and candles. Ronald's mother put the holy water around the house. She put the bottle in Ronald's room and lit a candle. The bottle was picked up by something invisible and then smashed. The flame of the candle shot up to the ceiling. Ronald's mother quickly blew out the candle and luckily nothing caught on fire. Father Hughes went to the house and heard Ronald speak in fluid Latin. The translation of something Ronald said is, O priest of Christ, you know that I am the devil. Why do you keep bothering me? At this point, Father Hughes knew Ronald would need an exorcism. Father Hughes recommended Ronald stay in the hospital to stop him from doing any harm. Near the beginning of March, Ronald was admitted to the hospital. He was strapped down to a bed. Father Hughes started performing an exorcism while Ronald started saying curses in different languages. Ronald somehow got his arm out of the restraint, took a spring for the bed, and slashed Father Hughes in the arm. His whole arm, from his shoulder to his wrist, was cut. Father Hughes had to get 100 stitches to close the wound. After that, Father Hughes was deeply disturbed and stopped working with Ronald. Ronald's mother decided they should probably get out of the city and see if that would help. Ronald's mother was from St. Louis, so they talked about going there. Then one night, Ronald was getting ready for bed. He went into the bathroom and screamed. His mother rushed into the bathroom and saw the words Louis scratched into his chest. She then pulled down his pajama pants and saw Saturday scratched into his hip. So on Saturday, March 5th, they went to St. Louis. While there, Ronald was totally normal during the day. But when he was getting ready for bed, he entered a trance and started yelling and acting wild. In mid-March, the family contacted a group of priests who could perform exorcisms on Ronald. Father William Bordrum led exorcisms almost every night for a month. Bordrum was a Jesuit Roman Catholic priest and a war veteran. 
He was both strongly religious and tough, and toughness was needed to fight a demon. Odin believed he wasn't battling a mere demon. He thought he was fighting Satan himself. But no matter what the priest did, Ronald kept getting worse. Ronald's bed would shake, scratches would still appear on his body, and furniture would fly around the room. Ronald would thrash around the bed with unnatural strength. He'd bite the people who held him down. For hours, Ronald would switch between calm and wild. Ronald would speak Latin and urinate in the bed. As a result, his bed smelled awful. Ronald would be in intense pain like his insides were on fire. He screamed obscenities at the priests. Once he said, go to hell you dirty sons of bitches. The next day, Ronald wouldn't remember what happened the night before. The priest asked Ronald's parents if they could convert him to Catholicism to help their fight against Ronald's demonic possession. They agreed and began teaching Ronald about the Catholic Church. Ronald was baptized on April 1st. The next day, Ronald received his communion. The priests continued to regularly perform exorcisms. As they did, Ronald started acting more and more like himself. April 18th was the day after Easter Sunday. Finally, it seemed that their exorcisms had worked. Ronald and his family returned home to Cottage City a few days later. Ronald went on to live a normal life. His identity as the person who inspired the exorcist was kept secret for decades. He worked as an engineer at NASA and helped with the Apollo missions in the 1960s. He created technology so that shuttle panels could handle intense heat. He retired in 2001. Ronald Hunkler died in 2020 in Marriottsville, Maryland at the age of 85. For decades, the young man who experienced the exorcism was known as Roland Doe or Robbie Mannheim. In 1949, a vague account of Ronald's story and the exorcism made its way to the media. One of the people who read the newspaper accounts was William Peter Blatty. For his popular book and film, Blatty drew inspiration from Ronald's story and other exorcisms. For the past several years, people investigated the identity of the boy at the center of the exorcism. In December 2021, the Skeptical Inquirer and the Guardian revealed his true identity as Ronald Hunkler. Number 1. The Exorcism of Emily Rose Fingenberg is a small town in Bavaria, Germany. In the 1970s, the city had a population of around 800 people. Annalise Michelle lived there with her parents, Anna and Joseph. She and her family were deeply religious and attended church twice a week. As a teenager, Annalise felt like she had to rid other people of their sins. She slept on a stone floor to atone for the sins of people who did drugs and slept at the train station. When she was 22, Annalise went to the University of Würzburg in Bavaria. She studied theology and education. She was nice, shy, and decorated her room with religious symbols and pictures. She would pray every night. But soon her prayers turned to voices of demons telling her she would rot in hell. She started seeing the face of the devil everywhere. Annalise started knocking pictures of Jesus off walls and she smashed crucifixes. She believed that she was possessed. In 1975, her parents told her to withdraw from school and move back in with them. When she returned home, she would rip off her clothes and urinate on the floor. She would then lick the urine off the floor. She would hit and bite her family members. She would scream for hours. 
She stopped eating because she said demons forbid her from eating. Instead, she would chew on spiders, flies, or charcoal. One time, she bit the head off a dead bird. She crawled under a table and barked like a dog for two days. Her parents contacted the local parish. Someone from the local parish got in touch with an exorcist in Germany. Without even seeing Annalise in person, he determined that she was beyond medical help. He said she had compulsive symptoms of being possessed by the devil. He recommended an exorcism. The exorcist consulted Bishop Joseph Stungle about the case. The bishop assigned Father Wilhelm Renz and Reverend Ernest Alt to do the exorcism. But the bishop said they would have to do it in secret. Over 10 months, Reverend Alt and Father Renz performed about 70 exorcisms. Father Renz put his hand on her forehead and recited Latin prayers. Annalise screamed, Take your filthy paws off. What do you want? You can pray as long as you wish. Nobody will listen to you. Father Renz thought that Lucifer was speaking through her. Annalise would get on her knees to pray 500 times a day. She broke her bones and ripped tendons in her knees from kneeling so often. Father Renz audio recorded 43 of the exorcisms because he thought it was so rare to capture the voice of Satan. Father Renz thought that Annalise was possessed by six demons. These six demons identified themselves as Adolf Hitler, Lucifer, Judas Iscariot, Cain, and Nero. He said Annalise would speak in distorted voices in foreign languages. She would convulse violently. On June 30th, 1976, during an exorcism, Annalise jumped from the couch and ran toward a wall. Her parents quickly put a pillow against the wall to soften the impact. After hitting the wall, Annalise fell back onto the couch and said, Oh God, that was a struggle today and promptly fell asleep. The next day, 23-year-old Annalise Michelle was dead. Annalise's parents called a doctor and asked for a death certificate for her burial. The doctor refused and instead called the police. The police found Annalise's dead body at her parents' home. After Annalise died, Father Wren said it was unusual he couldn't exercise the demons until her death. He said that it proved the power of Satan. Annalise's mother thought that the devil had killed her and her soul went to heaven. An autopsy revealed Annalise died of starvation, dehydration, and cardiovascular collapse, which means a lack of blood flow to the organs. It turned out that Annalise hadn't eaten or drank for weeks. She was only 68 pounds when she died. It turned out that as a teenager, Annalise blacked out of school and started walking around in a trance. Her body would shake uncontrollably. Annalise saw a doctor and she was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. The disorder can cause seizures, sudden fear, and hallucinations. She also became depressed. Annalise was also diagnosed with hyper-religious personality disorder, which is where someone becomes obsessed with religious beliefs. She also suffered from anorexia. Annalise took medication and went to therapy and responded well to the treatments, but she had stopped her treatments during the exorcisms. Annalise's parents, 57-year-old Anna and 61-year-old Joseph, along with 40-year-old Reverend Ernest Ault and 67-year-old Father Wilhelm Renz, were charged with negligent homicide for not providing Annalise with medical assistance. The trial started in March 1978. Doctors testified that Annalise could have survived if she had gotten medical treatment just one week before she died. The doctors also said she wasn't possessed, but she suffered from epilepsy and strict religious upbringing. In April 1978, they were all found guilty 
and they were all given six months suspended sentences. Annalise Michelle's story inspired the 2005 movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Around its release, a reporter spoke with Anna, who was then in her 80s and still lived in Klingenberg. Her husband, Joseph, had died six years earlier. Anna said she didn't want to see the film. Anna still believed that the exorcism of her daughter was justified. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope you found it interesting. If you did find it interesting, please make sure you subscribe. We'll have a new video about the paranormal every week. If you just discovered this channel, please make sure you check out our other channel, Criminally Listed. We have over 325 videos featuring bizarre but true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash listed. We also have a podcast about cold cases that were eventually solved called Criminally Listed Presents Into the Killing. You can find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.